All right, here's a container. You get a shot of that, Jimmy? Yep. And what are you going to do with it? Well, this is water uh, we're going to take from Clark Lake. And we're going to take it down to Mississippi with us to the Gulf. And we're going to dump it in the Gulf and bring some Gulf water back. Probably okay. dump it in Clark Lake. Sounds we're great. Clark Lake. Yeah. <laughs> there it goes. Don't bring any zebra mussels. trip purely for adventure. They set out from Clark Lake, Michigan on June the 7th and arrived this morning here in New Orleans. As part of the arrival ceremonies, the rafters poured water from Clark Lake into the Mississippi and uh, they return home. When they do, they'll have a bottle of the Mississippi River water to dump into Clark Lake. Should be a law against it. How does a Huck Finn dream become the adventure of a lifetime by Jim Schultz? I, with three other Clark Lake buddies, realized that Huck Finn dream in 1996. I had not yet realized my real dream, which was to make a video about the project. I mean, that's why I took three cameras down the river. And then there's this letter from my therapist Dear Jim, that's me. This is my reality. It's time to make a decision about your writer's block. ADD and depression resulting from your failure to complete a video of your 14-day journey from St. Louis to New Orleans. It is my professional opinion that even with your issues, 20 years should be a sufficient time to complete such a project. Well, not to be picky, but the 900 mile journey started from Chester, Illinois, not St. Louis. But like I told my therapist, we learned very quickly that the Mississippi River does not respect goals. This is my $40,000 hat. It represents the time and the money volunteers, the Clark Lake Spirit Organization and our crew raised to make this trip. But I remember the first time I put this hat on. We had just left Clark Lake in our donated motorhome. We stopped in Effingham, Illinois and learned that our planned launch site was canceled because of the flooding of the Mississippi River. After that phone call, I started doubting if I'd ever wear this hat on the Mississippi River. Again, in my professional opinion, I am recommending strong medicine. It is essential that you discard all mementos from the trip. My last bill will be in the mail. Please sign the check this time, sincerely. <sighs> Easier said than done. You see, our Huck Finn dream came true. The stories got stretched a little after 20 years, but the fact remains that Greg Kerr's childhood dream came true. The way I heard it, Greg Kerr's fourth grade teacher read Huck Finn in class, and Greg never forgot it. It says a lot about teachers and about Mark Twain. If you remember the story, and being a lit miner, I do, Tom Sawyer was the dreamer and the communicator. Huck Finn was the doer and the questioner. Both Tom and Huck had a sense to appreciate the freedom that we all long for. And they found it on the Mississippi River. And they had the wits to survive. Twain hit an all-American nerve there with those characters and the river. We all seem to be somewhere in between. If that wasn't true, would we still be reading and writing about them and the Mississippi River?
Kerr, an outdoorsman, owned a plumbing and heating company, and he could do anything with metal. He was simply following his hunk and dream. In 1995, he recruited fellow Clark Lakers, Bill Tuttle, a middle school teacher, and Jim Swain, a mechanical engineer. Bill was a sailor who wanted the adventure. He was our Tom Sawyer, as he quickly became the voice of the raft. Swain, a serious camper, looked forward to the details of the trip and the challenges. He was more towards Huck, always thinking ahead. And at the end, that's what navigated us through many forks in the flooded Mississippi. Me? Rumor has it, I was the second or third choice, but I jumped at the chance. I wrote the introduction to the reprint of Marquette's 1673 journal. And his words upon entering the Mississippi River in a birch bark canoe with a joy I cannot express just were burned into my brain and I wanted to experience that same joy. This is where the trip is starting. Um, we're in Chester, and we're going to put off on a little tributary of the Mississippi uh, where the telephone pole is, the ramp to launch boats normally is. So it's flooded, but uh, the people here are the first real positive people we've had who said, no problem. Uh, just keep your heads, don't do anything stupid, have a good journey. I remember wondering if we'd ever wear this life jacket as we traveled towards the Mississippi River. The high water caused problems getting our fixed top raft under a low bridge. But as a crew, we worked together and got through. We met our first challenge on the water. We continued with high spirits toward the Mississippi. As we neared the Mississippi River, the guys worked me for wearing my life jacket so soon. But their attitude soon changed as our raft hit the Mississippi River. No planning can prepare you for the power of the mighty Mississippi River. That was just the beginning of our reality check. We assumed there would be docking space all along the river, but they were all covered by the flood. Sun was going down on our first day of the river, and we could find no place to dock except deserted islands and a tree-lined shore. Thank the Lord for our motorhome crew that decided to stay behind. Using our five-pound cell phone, they guided us to a single ladder on the Cape Girardeau wall that protects the town from the flooded Mississippi. We learned the power of the river as Kerr overran the ladder by three feet. It took all 50 horses of the Honda motor to simply go three feet backwards. That's the power of the river. I remember reading that the Mississippi River is like Lake Erie coming at you eight miles an hour. Climbing up the ladder and over the wall, we walked the short distance to downtown Cape Girardeau and met our motorhome crew and the unofficial mayor of Cape Girardeau. This cross has been with me since our journey. It was given to me by my wife-to-be at the start of the christening. The chain had to be repaired due to me tugging on it so much because of what happened on the second night of our journey. The second day started out quite normal. We were on the river by 8 a.m. It was a cool mist, a little cooler than we thought. In fact, we had to put a tarp up to protect whoever was driving the raft from the harsh west wind. Yet, we made good time, and around 5 p.m., we pulled into New Madrid, Mississippi. The dock area was flooded, and it was crowded with 
pipes of all types. So the sun was out, we were feeling good, we decided to try to make it to the next stop. Big mistake. We ended up on the river at night. We went from being in a tense situation to a dangerous situation. For the river is filled with debris and the key person besides the person driving the boat is the person who's in the lookout position. Sometimes there's actually trees coming down the river. We used our flashlights to try to see our way. We narrowly missed getting hit by a big barge. Then a wonderful sight appeared. It was a Mississippi River gambling boat. We were able to reach the captain with our walkie-talkies and in his smooth southern voice he said, I really appreciate the adventurism and the daring you boys have, but you're not too smart. To be on the river at night is absolutely dangerous. He was then kind enough to guide us to the next port. We wake up from our sleeping positions on the raft, thankful to see Welcome to Carothersville, the same sign that we saw by flashlights the night before. We get our third ride in a pickup to get gas and food. We wash up and have breakfast at a nearby casino. And this would be a pattern that would follow us up and down the river. Rides in pickup trucks to get food and gas and washing up at casinos. Several farmers were there to see us off. One of them said, you boys are gonna be driving from bean field to bean field. That's how flooded this river is. As we journey farther south, the water sometimes resembles smooth circles of melted glass swirling through the choppy waters. We are now on the lookout for dangerous whirlpools. They were even mentioned in Father Marquette's journal. When the GPS is not working, we rely on the traditional method of finding your way on the Mississippi River, and that's spotting the poles that are up every mile all the way down to New Orleans. Often you have to use binoculars. Because of our near-death experience last night, Swain places a captain's hat on Kerr's head, and we all drink to that. I'm sure this happens since the dawn of river travel. There would be no more arguments once we are on the water. Kerr was our captain. We have now become a real river crew. The motor and our spirits are wide open. We just got the go-ahead from Memphis to dock at the Memphis Yacht Club. What a joy when we wake up on board our raft in a covered dock with complete facilities. We spend the morning organizing our stuff. Each of us was allowed to bring certain personal items. I brought cameras and a computer. Kerr brought a 38 revolver and a shotgun. Swain brought packets of survival gear, food. Tuttle brought goodies, i.e. Clark Lake cookies and a bottle of Royal Crown. We spent the rest of the morning at the Peabody Hotel, meeting people from all over America and the world, waiting to see the ducks walk down the red carpet and into the fountain. The ducks finally walk down the red carpet and into the pond, while hundreds of visitors cheer. I loved Mud Island. In fact, I still got the Mud Island Yacht Club polo shirt. The harbor master tells me that the river is like a small town and we are okay by the big barges. They know that we have an extra motor and all the communication equipment. What they don't like is tourists coming down unprepared and dying in the river. It gives the river a bad name. They would now stop and help us. That makes our day. We feel we're part of the river now.
We leave Memphis and are greeted by a rough Mississippi. The winds pick up and the barge traffic is heavy. After 76 miles of travel, we anchor on a remote river bank near Helena, Arkansas. And for security, we take turns walking in pairs the half mile through the woods to the Lady Luck Casino for dinner. Around 8.30 p.m., huge lightning bolts fill the sky and it begins to rain. Tuttle and I thought we heard some taunting voices in the woods. We scramble for Kerr's gun and remove it from the case. Meanwhile, Kerr and Swain come on board and Kerr, seeing us with his gun, says, the Mayberry Sheriff and his deputy in action. I never asked who was Don Knotts. We pass mile marker 643. We have now traveled 400 miles and are 600 miles from the Gulf of Mexico. In the late afternoon, we dock at the Low Key Greenville, Mississippi Yacht Club. We all have a great meal on the casino barge and I climb my first levee. We leave Greenville early in the morning. It stays sunny all day. This is the first true Huck Finn day. We have become relaxed about passing barges. We are now part of the river's flow. Here's Greg doing his best Huck Finn impression, letting the waves hit him while he sits in the front deck chair. It all makes me think of Twain, when Huck Finn and Jim complained about the big waves as the steamboats went by their raft. We pull into Vicksburg and dock at Admiral Peggy and Captain Dave's Marina. Once they learn my museum background, they show me their Jefferson Davis memorabilia. This is the start of the Civil War Happened Yesterday territory. We have another good casino meal and our first crawdads. Life can be good on the river. We leave Vicksburg early. One stretch of the river is so hazy, I feel like we are traveling inside of a cloud. The sun comes out, and after a hundred more Huck Finn miles on the river, we arrive in Natchez, Mississippi. We dock next to the Mississippi Queen, a five-story paddle wheel boat. The captain of the Mississippi Queen graciously takes time to give us advice. The captain urges us to stop at Baton Rouge. He recommends we follow the Port Allen Channel west to Morgan City and then back to New Orleans. He reasons that this route is more in keeping with our spirit, as the route from Baton Rouge to New Orleans is crowded with ocean-going vessels, and our raft will just be treading water in their huge waves. North now, and I'm going to pan, and I'm going to show you where we're going to go eat tonight, which is right across the river. We've met a couple of nice people who given us tours of um, their own personal plantation and their family. Um, and we're going around, we're on the deck of uh, the second floor of the Under the Hill Bar. Tuttle has evolved into our communicator and he negotiates our dock space with Miss Rita and our sleeping quarters with Big Andre. Staying overnight in the Mark Twain room at Big Andre's Lower Natchez bed and breakfast was a real riverboat captain's experience. We toured the Mark Twain room, great tours of the town of Natchez. A young couple from Upper Natchez wants to hear all about our journey and invites us to their family's Greek revival mansion on a bluff overlooking the Mississippi River. We are treated to a southern meal featuring the best pork medallions I've ever tasted. We leave Natchez early in the morning with the words of Big Andre ringing in our ears. These boys are not tourists anymore, they're river transients. Natchez, the crew of the spirit loves you. Four hours south of Natchez and averaging 19 miles an hour, the Mississippi River the way we envisioned it. But. The river gets rough as we approach Baton Rouge. We leave the Baton Rouge skyline for our first lock. Yes, this is this is uh, the, the spirit with the 24 foot pontoon. Uh, we're looking for somebody to to help us. Over. Uh, William, what is your destination anyway? We want uh, our destination is 
uh, is New Orleans. Once inside the lock, all of our preconceived apprehensions disappear. Coming through the lock, we are lucky to meet Captain Pat Dempsey of the Army Corps of Engineers. He advises us on how to travel through the Port Allen Channel. Our 24-foot raft has just been lowered 40 feet in a lock built for a thousand-foot barge. Once out of the lock, we follow the tree-lined channel to Floyd's Marina. Rather than the winding Mississippi River, the channel is straight and dominated by souped up boats with 250 horsepower outboard engines. It reminds me of growing up on Woodward Avenue in the 1960s. At Floyd's Marina, the men on the porch make no eye contact. None of them look friendly or wave. You all come up here. But while Kerr is quietly getting gas, Tuttle's communication skills come to our rescue. Things change fast when Floyd comes down to greet us. It turns out he likes Big Ten basketball and is a Henry Ford history buff. It's Southern hospitality to the max as the folks at Floyd's cook us a dinner. We tell stories of Judd Heathcote and Bobby Knight and they tell stories of Boudreaux, the irreverent Cajun legend who mocks all things civilized. We are invited to partake in the morning ritual of getting coffee at the trailer. As the song says, people on the river are happy to give. Kerr slept on the raft last night, while we slept on an $80,000 air-conditioned houseboat. To pick a favorite port is tough, but to dock deep in the bayou and be treated to a catfish, redfish, okra dinner at 10 p.m has got to be one of them. Within a half hour, we are passing through the bayou. This was the part I daydreamed about before we left. And then we have to go through two more locks. Passing small barges as the weather changes, we experience our first tropical storm as we near Morgan City. We pull into the first dock area we come to. It turns out to be a rough section of Morgan City, Louisiana. But women waiting for shrimp boats to come in notice our plight and call police to watch our raft through the night. These women also take us in two-man shifts to a wonderful local restaurant that serves Morgan City soul food. What a treat on a stormy night. Before leaving Morgan City, Bill makes the usual daily morning phone call to WKHM Radio in Jackson, Michigan. Wax, he's on the phone right now. We're just waiting to go on the air. We do this every morning at 6.45, our time. To report the Spirit's progress. It seems that most of these towns have an unofficial mayor, complete with the town history and the town's proud role in the civil, I mean, the war between the states. Traveling from Port Allen Channel to the Intercoastal Waterway, we travel through locks and under bridges of every shape and size. As we near Lafitte, Louisiana, it starts raining hard. We pull into a private covered dock. We worry about being asked to leave as a man gets out of a BMW. He comes over to us and welcomes us to Lafitte. He is Randy Schaefer, an oral surgeon from New Orleans who docks his $160,000 houseboat at this yacht club. While Bill had his Huck Finn shower, the rest of the crew took showers on Randy's houseboat, and then all of us had dinner at Randy's favorite restaurant. I remember the great tasting crawdads piled high on plates. They just kept coming. What a great way to get fired up for the last leg of the journey. The journey from Lafitte to New Orleans means more locks and bridges, and then the Mississippi River one more time. Ocean-going vessels, choppy waves, and one more 12-foot barge wave drenches our deck, but nothing can dampen our spirits when the Jackson Square steps come into view. Our journey ends today, Thursday, June 20th, 1996, as the spirit touches the wooden steps at New Orleans, 
a local television crew records our actual docking. A street musician plays Old Man River on a saxophone for us. Our journey of more than a thousand miles is over. But like the ever-present current of the Mississippi River, the spirit of the people we met along the way will always be with us. Well, after 13 days maneuvering down the Mississippi River, four Michigan men arrived here in New Orleans this morning. The four decided to make the trip purely for adventure. They set out from Clark Lake, Michigan on June the 7th and arrived this morning here in New Orleans. As part of the arrival ceremonies, the rafters poured water from Clark Lake into the Mississippi. And uh, they return home. When they do, they'll have a bottle of the Mississippi River water to dump into Clark Lake. Should be a law against it.